Mountain bikes run amazingly well, especially if you consider we run them on rough terrain that can rattle things loose and in dirt and mud that can work its way into things like bearings and generally wear things out. All too quickly, your lovely mountain bike can end up sounding like a rattly old clunker, but not to worry. In today's video, we're gonna show you 11 ways to make your bike feel brand new again. Although brands like Shimano make things like transmissions and brakes, those things are never gonna work well if your mountain bike hasn't been looked after or even assembled correctly in the first place. So Shimano asked us to make this video to highlight the importance of having a well set up and maintained mountain bike. Let's not forget things like a sticky free hub inside your hub there, that's gonna affect your shifting and how the bike pedals. And things like a sticky suspension fork, that's gonna affect your braking and your steering. So in no particular order, Let's whiz around my bike to highlight the sorts of things that can make your bike feel a bit old and how to cure them. Okay, first up, jockey wheel replacement. Now the jockey wheels are often called pulley wheels, sometimes called guide wheels, depending on the brand or the derailleur you're using them. But essentially, they all do the same thing. They route the chain through that lower cage of the derailleur. And of course, because of where they are, they're subject to the spray off your front wheel and your back wheel getting hit on things, getting in the mud, and even taking the full brunt when you're cleaning your bike. So it's unsurprisingly that these little nylon plastic wheels are gonna basically start feeling the toll there. To get a good idea of how they might feel, remove your chain from the front chain ring so there's no chain running over the wheels themselves, and have a little feel, see if they feel notchy or anything like that, if there's any play in them. Now you might have wheels on your bike that have replaceable bearings, but the chances are they've probably got a bushing in there or a pressed in bearing. But the thing you need to take into account is the wheels themselves are made from a nylon style plastic and they can wear out. So your best port of call is just to replace them. Now the only thing you need to take care of when you're replacing them, no matter what brand you go for, is to make sure they're the correct speed so they're compatible with your chain. And when you're cleaning your bike, make sure you give the rear derailleur a bit of love on its own. It's very easy just to look at the chain and look at things that look visually clean. Get down there a bit closer. I like to use a fine pick, something like that. You could use a very small flathead screwdriver and scrape off that gunk that gathers on the side, both sides of those wheels. That's the stuff that works into your chain and wears that out as well. And obviously it's gonna do no good if it's down there. So just give your rear derailleur a little bit more love than you think it needs. And it's gonna carry on shifting and running smoothly with less friction. Next up, inner and outer cables. Now, although many mountain bikes today come with hydraulic disc brakes on, virtually all bikes will have a cable operated derailleur. And if you're running a dropper post, it's pretty likely that it's gonna be cable operated as well. Now, inner and outer cable systems work brilliantly, especially full length ones that run internally on frames, provided that you don't get any water into the system. If water gets in there, it's gonna corrode the actual metal cable. And of course, that's gonna add friction to the system, which in turn adds to shifting inconsistencies or dropper post performance, depending on where yours is. So there's a few things you can do here. Now, I recommend checking this annually on most bikes, depending how wet the conditions are that you ride in. Now, your first option would be to remove the existing cable from the bike, but you only can be able to do this if your cable isn't frayed at the end when you remove the cable end cap that's crimped on there. So take care with this as you take the end cap off. If it looks like it can be slid back in easily enough, then go for it. So pull the cable all the way out to the shifter end. Of course, you wanna make sure the shifter's feeling nice and good anyway. Flush the outer housing with some spray lubricant. It's easiest to get into the actual housing. And of course, make sure that whatever spray comes out, wherever you're spraying it, uh, can't go anywhere near your braking surfaces, and then reinstall the cable. The next option would be to replace the inner cable with a fresh one. Uh, that's almost guaranteed to get much better performance straight out, provided that the outer cable or the outer housing is actually in good condition. Again, flush it through, put a fresh cable through, and of course, the third part would be to replace both the inner and the outer housing. Now I know riders that replace theirs annually without fail, just because they ride in such wet conditions that by the end of a year, the shifting is kind of a little bit sticky, got a little bit of friction on there. Remember how light the action is on modern day shifting. It should be really easy, shouldn't be any sort of effort to push the shifters at all. Uh, so that's a very cheap one to do and it's always worth keeping a few spare cables at home. Next up, your headset bearings. Now, if you've got an older style bike, you might even have a bike that's old enough that has proper locking style headset on there. You'll have the luxury, I say luxury, but you'll have the luxury of having cup and cone style bearings. So you'll be able to fully service that, replace the grease in there, freshen them up and put it back together. 
but with modern day mountain bikes, they tend to have drop-in bearings. So this actually is much easier to maintain because it's as simple as replacing the bearings. Now you've got to think the headset actually has a pretty hard life because the amount of weight that goes through it constantly, jumping, the leverage from your handlebars, from your front wheel, and you might not feel it when you're just turning your headset like this. If you take your wheel out, you might feel it a bit, but the best way to do it is to remove the stem from the bike, remove the fork from the bike, and actually feel the bearings by hand. Inspect them as well. How do they look when you remove it? Is the grease still looking fresh and clean that's in there, or is it looking really gunky and mucky? So if your bearings are feeling notchy or there's any play in them, you're gonna to need to replace them. You're not gonna be able to salvage them by taking the covers off and putting fresh grease in. You're gonna need new bearings. Now there's two ways of doing this. The first option is to look at the brand of your actual headset and then look on the website. Chances are, like this one, which is an Acros one, you go on their website and they list spares. So you can actually get the spare bearings from there. The other method is to do the DIY approach. Look at the code that's on the bearings. You'll find that there's a code written on there. Sometimes it's on the seal, sometimes it's on the actual outside. And go direct to a bearing supplier. There's many of them and there's in fact mountain bike bearing suppliers out there that do everything from pivot bearings, bottom bracket bearings and headset bearings. You might save yourself a few quid there, uh, but you might end up having to buy like a few sets. So uh, it could work out quite well for you. Now, when you're putting your headset back together and just for general maintenance, especially if you ride in wet conditions, make sure you put plenty of grease on top of the bearings and underneath them. You wanna sit them in a load of grease. And the theory is here that although the grease is actually on the inside of the cartridge bearing that won't affect the action, you're creating a barrier against water getting into that bearing to flush out the, the grease that's actually in there. So just think of it as a waterproof barrier. Then of course you're gonna to wanna to wipe the excess off because you don't want dirt and grime to stick to your bike. But just think, there's a lot of weight that goes through those two little bearings and not many people pay that much attention to them. So give them a bit of love and your steering will feel really nice again. Next up, shock bushings. Now these are the things in either end of the shock used to mount it to the bike with the hardware. If you feel your shock and it's got any sort of movement in there, like a little rattly movement, firstly, check the hardware is tight, because it might have just rattled loose, which we'll get to later in the video. But more importantly, if the actual bushings themselves are worn out, they're gonna rattle. Now in some cases, this can lead to damage to your shock because the shock and the mounting system relies the shock to be tight in its fittings. So if this is a job you think that you can do yourself, Get yourself one of these tools. All it's for is for pushing the bushing out of the, the actual shock and pushing it back in again. A dead simple tool, and you can get yourself a bag of these which will be appropriate for various different shock absorbers. Get the ones that will fit yours and your frame. It's a dead simple process. This is how you do it. Remove the shock bolts. Remove the shock absorber from the bike. If it looks like any parts of your frame will contact, stuff some rags in there just to make sure you don't lose any paintwork or damage anything. Next up, remove the O-rings and any sort of spaces that are on the outside of the actual bolts there in the hardware. And next up, mount the tool in the vise and use it to carefully push the bushing out and then reverse the process to put the new ones back in. Thread lock. Now, let's not forget, even if your mountain bike has got really big fat tires and really good suspension, it's still subject to loads of vibration. And some parts on your bike are gonna rattle loose easier than others. So do take care with this. Now when you get your thread lock, make sure you don't use high strength, use a medium strength, which tends to be blue. Loads of brands on the market and you only need just a little drop on the bolt that you're using it on. Don't forget, you're not trying to bond the bolt in place. You're literally just trying to clog the threads a little bit so it doesn't rattle loose with time. Now there's a number of things in your bike need to pay attention to that can be costly and also for safety. Shock mounting bolts, they're a candidate for rattling loose and of course your pivot bolts as well. Now some particular bikes will have a bolt on them that can be subject to coming loose, especially if you're really hardcore the way you ride. Rear mech mounting bolt, that's another candidate there that can rattle loose on some bikes as well. Now, although this bike has a replaceable chainring as a whole, your bike might have a spider with replaceable chainrings on there and it will have four bolts. Those bolts are a prime candidate, get a little drop on each of those. And then finally, probably most importantly, is your brake hardware. And when I talk about hardware, I mean the disc rotors and then the calipers, the way they mount to the bike itself. Now the calipers, nice and easy, remove a bolt, put a little drop on there. But when it comes to disc rotors, you might notice your disc rotor bolts have blue thread lock on them as standard when you install them. If you've replaced your disc rotors more than once or twice, there's a good chance that that will be worn off. So it will do you no harm in removing them one by one and just put a little drop on each one and put it back on there just to keep everything safe and quiet. 
seat post minor service. So there's two things at hand here, the dropper element, which we'll do second, and the clamp element. Now, if you're anything like me, you probably don't maintain the clamp on your seat post until it does something like starts creaking. Now think of what happens, all the spray and the muck comes off your back wheel in the harbors under the saddle here, which, if you're like me, you just use a jet wash and just clean your bike. Now that dirt will work its way into the mounting hardware and creak in time. So do yourself a favor, every now and then, just remove it all from the bike. You've got two bolts, you've got the mounting hardware and the two pieces of the clamp. You'll probably find when you remove yours, you'll have loads of dirt and dust around there. That is a creaking saddle waiting to happen. So give it all a good clean and reinstall it on the bike. Now some people might want to use thread lock on the threads, but I personally would just use a small amount of grease just to make sure that I can tighten them correctly and take care of the angle of my saddle nice and easily. I don't want those bolts to be locked in place. And for the dropper post service, this only really applies to cable operated posts. This is a nice easy one to do to make your post feel that bit better. Undo that top collar there, slide it up and out the way. With your lever engaged, compress and depress the saddle a few times and you'll find the little bushing will just slide up out the way. Give it a good clean, put a small amount of suspension grease or oil on the underside and the overside of that little bushing, replace it, and then put the collar back in place. Then again, compress and depress the post a few times there, and you might find a bit of grease or oil comes up onto the stanchion surface with some muck. Give it a wipe and your post will feel that little bit smoother. Fork lower leg service. Now there's three different options available to you here. The super fast, the fast, and the proper service. So the proper service, there's gonna be a link down there to a video we've already made in how you can do that yourself at home and all the tools that you're gonna need. But for the other two options, you got two. The first one is just to literally make sure there's some lubricant underneath the two wiper seals that you hear. So the way to do that is to compress the fork a number of times, wipe up any muck that's on the fork there, then get some suspension lubricant and just put a small amount around the top of the seal there on both legs. Make sure you don't drip any near disc brake. It'll never work properly again. Then compress your fork a number of times and you'll find that some sort of dirt and muck will lift out onto the legs, give it a bit of a clean, and then your fork will feel that little bit more supple um, instantly, essentially. The next offering is a super speedy version of a lower leg service. It involves just sliding the lower legs off, draining the oil, and replacing that lubricating oil that basically lubricates the bushings and those seals. The way to remove your lower legs is simple. Remove your wheel from the bike, then you need to remove those foot bolts. That's the two bolts on the bottom. They might be covered with a rebound knob or a little cover, so take those off first. I don't undo the bolts all the way because you will need to just shock them with a mallet. Nothing hard, just a tap to make sure the rods on the inside of the leg are disconnected from the bottom of the outer leg. And then at that point, you might find some oil starts dripping out. So you just wanna have a cup or something ready to catch that oil. Remove the bolts. The second you remove them and you slide the legs down, the remainder of that oil comes out. Then flip your bike upside down and just replace the correct amount and the correct style of oil you need for yours. Uh, this one is Fox Oil. Next up is a tubeless sealant top-up. Now, if your bike has tubeless tires on there, the sealant will dry up. Now, depending on how much you put in the first place and the conditions you ride in, get to know when yours will dry up and then basically top it up. The quickest and easiest way to do this is get yourself a valve injector tool, a syringe essentially, there's loads of different options available to you, and get yourself the required amount of sealant, suck it up into the syringe, remove the valve core from your bike, squirt in the required amount, and then replace the valve core and reinflate your tire. Job done. Transmission replacement. So what I'm talking about with the transmission here immediately will be the chain ring, the chain, and the cassette. Now these are consumable parts, which means as you're pedaling, you are literally wearing them out. Now it's up to you how often you choose to replace them. Some people wait until they're knackered and replace the whole lot. But if you wanna get a bit more out of yours, get yourself a chain wear indicator tool, and before your chain is worn, replace it. That way you'll get more life out of the cassette because they tend to wear at equal ratios. But the chain on its own is cheaper to replace, of course, than replacing both of them. Now I know people have done two or three chains to one cassette because they've been vigilant in replacing them, so that could be you to save a bit of cash. Now with the chain ring, there's less telltale signs of when it's worn, so you have to inspect this yourself. If there's any teeth that are broken off from an impact, perhaps in a going over a rock or something, needless to say, you should replace it. Now if your bike has a narrow wide chain ring like this one on the front, one of the things that can happen to these over time is those teeth profile, the trough, will go from a nice rounded shape to a slightly hooked shape. And the effect of that is the chain will start hooking on the bottom as you're pedaling. You hear it just as it hooks up. 
classic sign you need to replace your chainring. Uh, so pay attention with that one and basically get to know how far you wear things out. You can just monitor it every time you wash your bike. Now, if you're a sort of rider that's going through chains and cassettes constantly and you're just spending and spending money, you might want to consider a slightly different approach. Now, granted, this has got an XTR chain and cassette on it. You could go for a deal to save yourself some cash. Well, the alternative method is to consider something like Shimano's Link Glide. Now, this is an 11-speed only system. It's not currently in 12-speed. However, the cool thing about this, despite it being much heavier, is it lasts on average three times longer. Now, if that sounds like something you're gonna make the most of, then it's a dead cert, isn't it, really? Brake rotors and pads. Now, another consumable item on the bike, but of course, these are, well, they're really essential to your safety, uh, being able to stop for things. Now, when it comes to your disc rotors, they will have a thickness, a minimum thickness that they can get to. They actually wear out, which not a lot of people pay attention to on bikes. Now, Shimano rotors like these ones are 1.85 millimeters thick, and they should be replaced when you get to 1.5. Now, it does actually say on the rotor itself, you can't see it on this one because the rotor is actually so worn, but I'll show you on this one now. On screen, you can see the fact it says replace at 1.5. Get yourself a set of digital calipers and check yours routinely, because what happens is these literally sort of start peeling apart. And we've seen this happen on brakes that people have just used until there's like almost nothing left. If that starts peeling apart when you're braking, you're not gonna stop. Now, when it comes to replacing your brake pads, it's a good idea to give your rotors a bit of a freshen up. Now, if they look like this one, I'd actually recommend a fresh pair of rotors. But if you'll still look pretty good, give them a clean up with some isopropyl alcohol or dedicated disc brake cleaner, and then get yourself some very coarse sandpaper. Give them a slight scoring, just a light dusting on the braking surfaces on both sides, making sure you don't get any oil from your hands on the surfaces. Give them another clean and finish with some boiling water and just let them dry. Uh, needless to say, it's easier to do this off the bike, uh, so removing them, in which case you can replace the, uh, the thread lock on the bolts at the same time. And then replace ready to reinstall your brakes. Uh, the idea, of course, when you're bedding in new brakes is to make sure you deposit some of the material from the pad on that surface. And if it's just slightly textured, it just helps them bed in just like a fresh set of brakes. And if your brakes still aren't feeling quite right, there's a good chance you might need to bleed them. Now, this is a process you're gonna to need to get some tools and some brake fluid especially for, but it's definitely something that is quite easy to do if you follow the steps and not something you should be afraid of. And there's gonna be some links to bleeding brake videos floating around down there. Now, when you're rolling along on your bike, you wanna hear the free wheel doing its job. But because of where it is on the bike, you get loads of muck and gunk that basically gets into the working mechanism and it starts slowing this down. Now you might notice if you've got your bike in a work stand, you're pedaling it along and you stop pedaling, sometimes the cranks will continue to go round. That is a sure-fired way that your free hub body is sticky. Now to get access to this, you need to remove the rear wheel from the bike, remove your cassette using a chain whip and a cassette tool from the bike, and then literally remove the body off. Depending on the model of your hub, you're likely to have push on end caps that literally will pull off and you'll be able to remove the actual body itself to get access. Now, if yours looks absolutely filthy on the inside, then have a word of yourself and make sure it doesn't happen again. Give it a good clean. Now, if you're gonna use a grease on the inside, you wanna use something that's very thin. You don't wanna use a big thick grease because you can stop the mechanism working as freely as it should. Some riders prefer to use oil, some riders prefer to use grease. Uh, but like I said, if you're using grease, just a very small amount. And uh, make sure the pools can work, but make sure they don't get clogged up on the inside there. Then reinstall it all back together again, and you'll find not only does it sound better, it's gonna perform better and it's gonna roll faster as well. There we go, that was 11 ways that you can make your bike feel brand new again. Of course, there's loads of other maintenance jobs you can do on your bike, but those are some of the likely candidates out there to make your bike just feel a little bit ropey when it really shouldn't be. Uh, hopefully this video has been helpful for you. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments underneath. And if there's any other sort of walkthroughs that you need us to do to help you work on your bike, please do let us know. We're happy to make those videos and we'll see you in the next one. See you later.